Mm. So I do, I have a little bit of a burning word in my heart, I'm not going to lie, and, and I had a whole message prepared, and I just scrapped it, man. I was in the back, I was on my knees, and I was praying, and I just, and I, and I can't explain it, and I'd be lying if I didn't tell you this, and it's been hard for me not to be emotional, because I love you all, and um, I really believe, I love your youth pastors, I love your youth leaders, I feel like this year specifically is something special, something's in the air, and I, as I was praying for you and praying over you, I really felt like there was a moment, and some of you, I'm not just talking to students, there's a lot of adult leaders in the room that I just got to be honest, I feel like I have a word for you too. I feel like God has a word for all of us that every single one of us maybe need to, needs to grab on to tonight, and I'm ready to roll. And I know some of you are tired, and I know that some of you, uh, you know, it's been kind of a long day, but I just want to tell you, there is something about a moment. And the moment that we're, we're going to walk into today happens at the Jordan River, and I, and I don't want you to miss this because it's the moment of all moments. You've been studying Elijah all week, and you would think that the thing that marks Elijah would be fired down from the mountain, but that's not the most important moment, I don't think, in his entire life. What's going to happen is they're going to go down to the Jordan River. The Jordan River is going to be this place where moments happen. There are certain places, hear me, where moments happen. And I don't know why it works that way, but I'm just telling you, I've been around a long time, and the more that I dig into the Word, there are places in life where moments happen. I want you to know, whether you know it or not, you were in a place where moments happen. It was in a CIY event when I decided for the very first time, I think that I was made for more, I think I could go into ministry. If you knew my life at the time, there's no way that you would say that that's possible. Um, most of, uh, you know, Kyle Eidelman, who's our current pastor, Dave Stone, who is our former pastor, uh, our best, some of our best volunteers, missionaries overseas that I get, sees that I get to see all the time, they, so many of them had a moment in this place. And that seems kind of weird, but it's real. So some of you are feeling a lot of things, and you're not sure what to do with it. And I just want you to know, you are in the place where moments happen. As a matter of fact, Elijah and Elisha are in a place well, there's going to be some pretty significant moments that are going to happen. I don't know if you remember this guy named Moses. Moses is a guy who brought the children of God out of, the, out of Egypt, out of sin, and he crossed the Red Sea. He going, went out. I wish I could take you somewhere there. Some of you in the room, I'm taking to Israel uh, this coming year. But I'm just telling you, Mount Nebo, it's this big place right on the other side of the Jordan. And they camped out, and right there in that moment, Moses was getting ready to leave, and Joshua was, uh, was about to take over, and there was a transition when that was going to happen. And guess where it happened? The Jordan River. As a matter of fact, that moment where everybody was waiting, everybody was waiting, everybody was waiting. We know what God's done in our past, but what will he do in our future? See, they had seen a lot of things. They saw waters part. They had seen a lot of things. They watched an impossible situation that they thought there was no way they could get out of, and they walked out scot-free, and God just kept showing up. But now they're on the mountain. Now they're looking into a whole new territory, a whole new place, and there are things that have never been done before, and God's promised it. He's promised that it can happen. And here they stand on the other, the other side of the Jordan. And if you study history, if you just read through this, it's down at the Jordan River. They have a transition. It moves from Moses to Joshua. And they go from a people. Moses is a great guy. Elijah was a great guy. But I'm, I, I need you to know this. But Joshua got to walk into the promises of God and got to live in the land of God that God had always promised. He got to do what Moses never got to do. There's another story, and it's with Elijah and Elisha, right? We're going to go down, and you're just going to think, oh, it's, you know, it's crazy, and why the Jordan, and why this? And so they're going to go down. As a matter of fact, when it goes from Moses to Joshua, if you remember the story, Moses, when he hands it off to Joshua, Joshua goes down, and the water splits. Do you remember that? They go down, and the people walk across on dry land. You're like, well, okay. But now you fast forward, now you've got Elijah. It's another big transition. Elijah has done things in the kingdom that I'm telling you that were extraordinary, that were amazing, that were powerful. No one had ever seen that. And yet, they're at a place where moments happen. And as they step down into the waters of the Jordan, and you're like, okay, why the Jordan? And, and why, why is he doing this? And he picks up his cloak, and he takes his cloak, and he, and he slaps the water with it, and the waters part again. And they walk across, and in that moment, it moves from Elijah to Elisha. There's going to be another time in the Jordan. You remember this one? There's this guy who's the best preacher of the day. His name's John the Baptist. 
As a matter of fact, uh, Jesus said of John the Baptist, there's been no man born of a woman greater than John the Baptist. This guy was well known all over the world. People would come from entire countries away, people up in Rome, people up in, uh, like all over the world knew who John the Baptist was. And John the Baptist was teaching and preaching down the Jordan and something happened in a transition. It was a powerful one. When down in that Jordan, the place where moments happen, they walk down into that Jordan River, and Jesus said, uh, John, I need you to baptize me. He said, man, come on, man, you got to be kidding me. He said, no, 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 this is how we do this. From that moment on, John the Baptist, whose ministry was powerful, transitioned to Jesus' ministry, and Jesus' ministry I think you know a little bit about. So why do I say that? Well, I just need you to know, for some of you in the room, you need this moment. You'll only get a couple of these moments in your lifetime, moments where you're in the right spot with the right people at the right time, and it's God's moment for you. And I'm telling you, some of you in the room need to hear this. This is your moment. And you got to figure out what to do with this, because we've been talking about a lot of things, and we've been talking about faith, and we've been talking about servanthood, and we've been talking about stepping into who you were made to be. But I'm here to tell you, you need this moment, and you can't let this moment pass by. So here's a story. Let's just unpack it. If you've got your Bibles, Bible apps, why don't you grab, uh, turn with me, 2 Kings chapter 2. And we're just going to read through this story real fast. And I think by now you know it, but here's what happens. They go down. They go down to the Jordan. I'll pick up verse 8. It says, Elijah took his cloak. He rolled it up. He struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left. And the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken from you. And I love their relationship. I don't know, I don't know who you have relationships like this, but man, I, we, we pray that you would find. The reason that we put great, that we'll do anything to get great men and women in your life is because we know the power of relationships in your life. The power of relationships in my life, I know the power of them. But they had such a strong relationship, and he, just, he, he knows he's getting ready to leave, and he just says to him, hey, listen, man, what can I do for you? I just want to bless you, man. I just want to bless you. And I love this. Eli Elisha says, um, well, you know, here, here's a little small thing. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Now, when I first heard that, I was like, dang, sucker, you're not playing. Like, you're just like, you just, you're, you're standing with the greatest prophet of the day. Like, this dude isn't going to die. He's going to like ride a chariot up to heaven. He's later on when Jesus is walking the earth. He and Moses are going to come back and have a chat with Jesus. He's the dude. And you want twice as much? You want more? Question. Is it even okay to ask for more? I mean, is it? One of the things we've been talking about up here is, man, you just need to keep things simple. You just need to keep things. Is it really okay to ask for more? Question, is it okay? Are you allowed to ask God to do something in your time, in your day, with your generation that mine's never seen? And I love this because uh, Elijah doesn't flinch. Elijah doesn't flinch because in his heart he's, 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 he's thinking the same thing I'm thinking when I see this room. Are you kidding me? You better do twice as much. So I have a mom. You all do too. You're welcome. You're tired, aren't you? Stand up real fast. Hug the person next to you real fast. Just love on them. Come on. All right. Tell, tell, tell the person next to you your mom's name. Tell them your name. Mom's name. All right, grab a seat, grab a seat. <laughs> that was like I was fishing to see if you're awake. So, so here's your reality. Let me, I, I just, I want to be personal. I'll keep this short because I know you all are tired, but I don't want, I, I, I'm being honest. I don't want you to miss your moment. So I, I'm, I'm going to be super transparent about this. And uh, my mom knows that I share this. And so I'm just going to be real. My mom, uh, 16 years old, grew up in a terrible home. Uh, some of you grew up in terrible homes. 
My mom grew up in a pretty bad one. She wanted to escape pretty bad. When she was 16 years old, she had her mom sign. You could do that back in the day. And she had her mom sign that, so that she could go get uh, married to a senior in high school. And they were going to run away. And she thought all of her problems were going to be solved. A little cliff note, most girls who are trying to get away from something and go after a guy because they think that's going to solve their problems. How often does that work? Can I get a witness? Don't trust them boys, girls. <laughs> So my mom married, uh, at 16 years old, married a guy. They weren't married more than six months before he started beating her pretty severely. She was pregnant by 18. Uh, when she was pregnant at 18, she had the baby. She thought, you know what, he's just beating me. This won't last. He doesn't really mean it. But all of a sudden, he started beating this uh, little child. And by one year old, my brother was put in the hospital by his father because of the beatings he was taking. Because he wouldn't be quiet. So here my mom is. She doesn't have her GED. She ran away from a home that doesn't love her, and she's got a man that's been beating her. What is she supposed to do? So she runs into the arms of my father, who is a Special Forces Vietnam veteran, because you don't mess with my dad, bro. <laughs> and, 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 and that was the safest thing she could think of, because that guy promised to track her down and kill her, which is not as uncommon as you think. And she lived her life in fear, and she ran to my dad, but my dad was beat up, man. He lived his whole life. His dad died when he was young. His brothers raised him. He didn't know Jesus. He didn't know what he was supposed to do. He gets shipped off to a war, asked to murder people, asked to kill people. He's not exactly sure why. He comes back with a, with a conscience. He's lost most of his friends in the war. And he, he just emotionally detached. How's this marriage going to go? And then they had me. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't solve their problems. <laughs> but I want you to know that um, my mom found something. What my mom found has altered the course of not only my life, but my kids' lives. And every grandkid, I, pro I hope ever that anything that ever comes from us. And by the way, also has affected a whole bunch of people in here that I, that I have loved like my own children. And that is because somebody said to her, you've got to come hear this guy named Billy Graham. She walked in there, and it was the first time that, that, that A, that somebody really cared about her and spoke to her. She goes in there, and she hears the gospel message for the first time, and she just said, I just want Jesus. She came home. She, she pursued him with everything that she could. And I'm just telling you, this was a broken girl. She's a broken girl. And every morning she just pursued him, pursued him. But I just want you to know, she, my mom, I need you to hear this. My mom found the fire of the presence of the Lord, and it changed her life. But, I, but here's the thing. You know, my, my, my mom, she found that presence, but then you fast forward to me. See, see she is, is now walking with Jesus, but she's got all of this stuff to undo, all this past to erase, all of these heartaches and this loneliness and this brokenness, and Jesus is faithful to it, and Jesus is still working on her, but then you've got me, and all of a sudden, I am too, in this story, I'm the Elisha. And I'm watching as my mom is in a cave, watching when he, she's in the valley, wondering if the famine's going to stop, wondering if God's really going to come through on his word, wondering when my mom writes that check to uh, the people that she's writing to that I know that we don't have the money because we're completely broke, but her, she just feels like Jesus told her to, to give this money, and she's writing $100 checks. We don't have even close to that in our, and I, and I remember thinking as a six-year-old, I shouldn't even know about our finances, and I remember her just freely giving things away, and I'm sitting there going, there's no way, there's no way in every single time she did I watched God show up I watched God show up I watched God show up and all of a sudden I got to I got to be front row seat on a woman's life who found the fire of God's presence and things happen in her life that y'all I can't explain short of the hand of God so I just watch her and I watch her and I watch her but then I remember about your age I started asking, I, I, originally I thought, you know, God, if I could just know, I, if I could just know you like my mom does, because it's real. Some of you have been around fake Jesus, I get it. Some of you have, have parents and they say that they love Jesus, but in your home you know it's not true. 
Or maybe they're just not transforming yet. Or maybe they're still, they, they kind of love Jesus, but they're pursuing every single thing else. Kind of the same stuff that you, all of your friends are pursuing too. Or maybe you're, they're just as broken. Or maybe they're not even believers. But I'm telling you, I'm sitting there watching her, and I'm seeing her life go down. And I'm just sitting there saying, I want that. I want that. But something inside of me started to say, but what if there's even more than that? What if instead of waiting until I'm 25 years old, 30 years old, with a broken marriage and a broken kids, what if in those early moments, what if I found him earlier? What if I started making decisions when I was in high school about the right person to date and the wrong person to date? What happens, like, and I started seeing this double portion life. Is it okay to ask for more? Jesus said this, here's the problem, you don't have because you don't ask. And I think what my mom would say if I ask her, Mom, is it okay if, if, if I ask for more than you? She would look at me and say, you better take more than me. Because I want you to stand on my shoulders. I want, you, I want you to live instead of spend most of your life in then brokenness and find the fire. I want you to find the fire when you're younger. And because if you do that, what you're going to experience is you're going to actually experience the things that she never got to experience. Because of my mom, I need you to hear this. I, got, I, I get to experience fire in my marriage. And just so you know, yes, I think my wife's hot, but that's not what I mean. <laughs> and yes, I'm attracted to her. My, my two sons are like, stop. <laughs> I just need you to know that, that you can ask for more. You can ask for more than your parents. And, and let, me, let me take it to like a, like a really basic thing. Some of you are looking at marriages right now and the, and the things that are in front of you. And I pray that right now you're looking, that, that you're looking ahead and you're saying, man, I want to stand on the shoulders of the people in front of me. I want an incredible marriage. I want an incredible faith. I want to not just say that I'm a Christian and show up to church and be a moral person. Like I want to leverage my life for the gospel. I want my home to be a place where when people come in, like we are starting to see people come to Christ left and right. I want the kind of home where when my kids raise up, they have even better than me. They know him more personally than me. They don't, that, that in my home, that we don't spend our times chasing dollars and stuff, that we spend our time sp chasing the kingdom. That kind of life, a life where you, and hear me, I know a lot of people that are in their 30s and 40s feeling like they've wasted their whole life. They got the job that they wanted and the house that they wanted and the car that they wanted and the, and the 2.2 kids that they wanted and the car that they wanted to drive and they're still not satisfied with what they have, wondering how in the world they're ever going to wake up in the morning and be passionate about today and care about today and they're missing that fire and they're going through day after day after day and they don't even, they're, they're, they're just sleepwalking. And Elisha says, and I want fire. And I, 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 Elijah, I want fire. I want to stand on your shoulders. I want to learn from your past. I want to learn from your mistakes. I want to learn how, I, I don't want to have to wait until here. Tell me how you found the presence. Tell me when you were alone and you didn't know what to do, how, how you felt like God was never there, but then he was right there. Remind me of that because you had to sit there and you had to run off through a desert and you had to go out to a cave, but I get to stand in the place where I feel alone and absolutely right now know that God's here for me and that he's never left. That double portion life, man, where you just get to walk in fire and you get to, to wake up every day captivated and, and full and, and, and feeling alive. I'm just telling you, um, a double portion life is what you're made for. And I, and I just want to encourage you real fast. And tonight, here in a little bit, I'm going to encourage you to ask for it. The kind of future that will fill you in ways that, you, that, that your current plans could never do that. John 14, 12 says this, whoever believes in me will do the work that I've been doing. Jesus says, if you, if, here's, the, here's the reality. If you believe in me, you're going to do what I've been doing. You're going to be loving people. You're going to be protecting vulnerable people. You're going to be giving your life away. You're going to do this. And then he says this, and this is a line that we almost don't believe. And he says, they will do even greater things. What? How do you do greater things than Jesus? So Elijah and Elisha go down here, and they just have this conversation. And Elijah says to Elisha, uh, hey, what can I do for you? Elisha goes back to Elijah and says, I want, I want twice as much as you. <laughs> He's not offended by it the same way I wouldn't be offended by it with my sons or my daughter. Because I say to them all the time, uh, stand on my shoulders. Don't, don't repeat what I've done. Stand on my shoulders. You're going to be a better man. You're going be to be a better everything than me. Please be a better everything than me. Please find him earlier. Please don't waste time on things that don't matter. Please give your life to things that count. 
Please don't settle for friends that are going to continue to pull you back into the same old practices. Please don't settle for the same porn addiction that you've had for the last 10 years. Tell me that you're not going to be another 10 years down the road and still be walking in shame every single day because you are never transparent enough to tell somebody. Please tell me you're not going to do that. Girls, please tell me you're not going to date the next five guys before you recognize that every single one of them has taken a piece of your heart and had no other plans than, than, than to use you as a trophy and to, and to get his thrills from you. Please tell me that's the case. Please tell me that you're not going to give your life to social media. Please tell me that you're not going to play Fortnite five hours a week for the next nine years of your life. Y'all, I'm not hating on Fortnite, but come on. Why? Because you're made for more, man. Girls, you're made for more. Fellas, you're made for more. Some of you know more about Fortnite than you know Jesus. Tell me I'm lying. Tell me, tell me how many young men are sitting in the room. Right now with, this, with, with a more abiding passion for Jesus than catching up on ESPN, sharing memes on Instagram, and playing Fortnite. Am I mad? I'm not mad. I love you like fire. But that is not the road to a double life, y'all. You want to fire in your 30s, you're going to have to make some decisions. And that's what happens right here because as soon as this happened, he says, uh, you know, what, what can I do for you? And, and, and Elisha tells me, tell me to, you know, to let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. And this is what Elijah said, you have asked a difficult thing. Here's how I used to read this. Because I used to read this, and I was like, that is kind of a difficult thing. Because, man, look at what Elijah did, man. Brother's like, he's like the dude, man. And, and he, you know, he's like healing people. And he's, you know, he goes up on the mountain, and he calls down fire, and he, like, says a word, and a drought happens, and kings respect him. And, and man, you can't just ask for stuff like that. Like, God doesn't give that. But here's where I missed it. It wasn't about it's difficult because God can't do it. It's difficult because Elijah knew the road to get there. And I, I, as pure as I can make this, guys, uh, there is a road that is filled with, filled with so much life and so much freedom and so much, uh, like, just every single day is a gift and every day you're growing. You have the richest relationships that you've ever had. That's the nature of the kingdom. You end up getting more than you ever dreamed of. That's just true. But I'm here to tell you the road's harder than you think. Because see, what Elijah knew was um, before he stood on a mountaintop, he had to sit in a valley for about a year and a half and let a raven bring him food. He had to trust God in places that were hard. Some of you are going are, are gonna to say today, and I'm going to give you an opportunity, and I, and I hope that you take this moment. I really do. And some of you are going to say, I want to take this moment. But I want you to count the cost because the moment that I'm inviting you into does have a cost. I remember that moment when I was sitting in the woods and I was sitting there on my knees and I remember when I got up there and I said, God, I'll do anything, I'll go anywhere. And he said, good, because you're going to have to go home and break up with that girl. You know that, right? And I was like, she could become a Jesus follower. <laughs> He's like, that's not what I said. He's like, you know why you're dating her and you know that that's not, that's not my heart for you. And when you go back, you're going to have to make some decisions about your time. I was spending about, I didn't, even have, I didn't even have a sport at the time. And I'm going and I'm lifting like two, three hours a day. Why? Because guys want to work out so girls look at them. I know that sounds dumb, but that's just the way it works. And guys, if you say that's not true, you're lying through your, whatever. <laughs> and girls, like you don't spend time getting us, trying to get us to look at you. So let's just get over it. Three hours of vanity a day. Three hours of vanity a day. And I spent more time in the gym than I did learning about Jesus. And Jesus is as is, is good of a father as he, he just spoke, spoke in my chest. He said, Matt, what are you going to leave behind to live in the kind of life that you, that you really want? And all of a sudden, I, I, I just realized there, there's, there's going to be stuff that gets left behind. And, and I was joking before, but I'm just being real honest in here. Some of you, uh, for you to pick up what I'm about to talk about, you're going to have to figure out what gets left behind here. There's some relationships that need to get left behind. When I went back, there was a group of friends that I couldn't hang out with on Friday night. I just couldn't. Does that mean I didn't love them? No. 
Does that mean I stopped inviting them to church? No, I actually did. Several, quite a few of them came to Christ. Does it mean, but here's the thing, but I could not go and do the things we did with that group anymore. It meant that there were some places that I had to hop out of. It meant that we used to watch some pretty raunchy shows and some comedies that were pretty coarse. And he said, listen, if you re- I'm just telling you, Matt, if you want this, if you want to walk in fullness, if you want to walk in a marriage where you're content and you're satisfied and you're fueled and you know what you woke up for today and you want your life to count and you, want it to, you just want to leverage everything, I'm just telling you, I want that for you too. But what you have over here won't get you there. It's a difficult thing. And so some of you right now, you've been hiding addictions, you've been hiding loneliness, you've been hiding anxiety, you've told a couple people, but then when you didn't get past it, you stopped being transparent. And even right now in this thing, you're scared about going home because of the things that you're going to get caught up again right when you get there. And you still haven't told anybody, you have no accountability system, you're hoping that it just goes away. And that's not how it works. You're going to have to leave behind the fact of, of you trying to do this on your own. How long have you been trying to do it on your own now? And I'm just telling you, he just says, uh, here's the reality. Um, you, yes, God has more for you. And it's going to cost, y'all. Is his grace free? Yes, man, that's my favorite thing about him. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, and I love you. I, I was praying in the back for you. Some of the stuff that's in your life right now, I, and, you, and, and you know I'm right. Oh, it's killing you. And if I was your father and I could speak into your chest for a second, I would just say, come home, man. Sweet girl. You got to leave that behind. Do you realize what you're holding on to? And do you realize how much it is keeping you from what God has for you? So in this moment, I love it. They crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do, let me inherit a double portion. And Elijah just says, you've asked a difficult thing. But he says, here's the reality, but if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise not. And so, as they're walking along and uh, talking together, I love that, suddenly a chariot of fire, <laughs> uh, I still can't get it in my mind, a chariot of fire and two horses of fire appeared and they separate the two of them and Elijah went up into heaven in a whirlwind. And Elisha saw this and he cried out, my father, my father. Isn't that a cool relationship they had? Um, I've had some, some great people in my life um, that are like dads to me because I didn't have that. I, got to, I was the one that led my dad to Christ. And some of you, that's going to be you too. Um, I will say this. I'm sorry, just as an older brother. Some of you are still mad at your dad, and you're going to stay mad at your dad, and you can't, you, like, for me, if you were me, I'm not, I wasn't even sure that I wanted him to be a Christian. But then something started burning in my heart, and I just realized, um, I can't get to the end of this life and my dad not know Jesus. That's just real. And that's when I started praying on my knees and asking God to do the impossible. And it was, it was a hard thing. I'm just, that was for free. Verse 13, it says this, he picked up the cloak. Because Elisha, when he, when he went out, my father, father, chariots, and horsemen of Israel, the, Elisha saw him no more, and he took a hold of his clothes. Elisha did, and he tore him apart. That's just like, man, he was just so sad because he's, he's losing his friend. Verse 13, he says, he picked up the cloak that had fallen. A simple one. He picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah, and he went back, and he stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak that had fallen from him. And I love this. He picks up the cloak. The cloak is like, uh, it's like a mantle. It's like, uh, it's like the, the thing that, if you remember, Elijah put it on Elisha to call him. It's like this weighty thing. It's symbolic of, of something that's being, like, like, it's like a legacy of faith that's getting passed on. So he picks up the cloak and he walks back to the water. They had crossed across. That's what Elijah did. Elijah took the cloak. He hit the water. It split. So Elisha says, let's just try this thing out. So he just rolls it up. And he's like, bam. Splits. So let me just say this. And I'm going to get to the end. Um, Elisha got to spend time with Elijah, ask for a double portion life, heard that the road was going to be difficult, heard stories of faith, heard, watched, I'm sure as fire fell down from heaven, saw all the great things. At some point, though, Elisha had to decide to reach down and to pick up, to literally like pick up in his hands, like a physical, tangible, real thing in a moment that would forever define his life. And he had to pick up a mantle that he would now walk under. 
And he immediately, he wasn't like picking up something. Sometimes in here we talk and it's like, you know, one day you're going to do this, one day. And so he doesn't pick it up and go, ah, oh, that's going to come in handy one day. And just tuck it away and just, I wonder where I'm going to use this. He picks it up immediately. He recognizes that, that, that God wants to use him. That God wants to give him power. That God wants to give him the fire-filled kind of life that Elijah had. And all of a sudden, man, he, he just smacks it down. And, 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 and I bet he was, I bet it freaked him out. It would have freaked me out. First thing he's ever done like this, and it just parts. And so here's what I would say, and this is what I came to say. <laughs> um, I just want to encourage some of you in the room right now. Man, uh, I wish I had you rested and, rested and, 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 and bright-eyed. I don't right now. But I don't, want you, I, I don't want you to miss something. I think you're in a moment. Some of you juniors and seniors, you're not going to get many moments like this. And I bet if I know the Holy Spirit, and I do, he's the best friend I've ever had, that he's been speaking to a lot of you about who you could be and what you could do, that he has plans for you. And there's a mantle laying right before you tonight. And I, I don't know if you can see it. Some of you can't see it, and I get that. Some of you are just going to, you got to figure out how to follow Jesus, and you got a little bit. But I'm telling you, for some of you in the room, and, I, and it's bigger than you think, and it's not just students. There's some young men, there's some college-age students, some, some adult leaders in here. I've seen pe people doing their 30s and 40s. There's something that God has placed in front of you. It's a powerful work of the kingdom. You know you were made for more. You know you're, right now you're settling. You're just doing average stuff, and God's put something super natural, powerful, right in your path for you to live with fire, to you, for you to live with purpose, for you to live under a mantle that just says who you are and what you're doing, and it's right in front of you. And you've never picked it up. You've never fallen on your knees and just said, God, I want more. And God, I want more. Whatever it costs me, I want more. I want to walk under the mantle. The mantle is like one of these things that it's like, it's like the truth. It's like the reality of the kingdom. The reality is God can bring fire down on any mountain he wants to. Elijah figured that out. And as soon as he brings fire down on the mountain, he's like, and I'm going to burn that person up. I'm going to burn that. Like, he's just like, God can do this any time. I didn't know that. It's a reality of the kingdom. It's a reality of God. And so a mantle is one of these things that comes on you, and, and, and it's something that you start to wake up with every day, and you recognize that God made me for this moment, that, that, that I was made for this. You start walking this thing that, that, that we are a people who protect vulnerable people. And I'm going to wake up every day, and I'm, I'm going to spend my life protecting vulnerable people. We are a people. Here's the mantle that you get to be a part of. Where when, when we pray, things actually happen. We have a mantle on us where we don't have ordinary days. We have a mantle where we, we see lost people and we recognize that they're far from God. We'll give anything that we can to, to allow them to rise up. And like, like we will give anything. We love them. We want to pursue them. We want them to be a part of a kingdom. And there's a mantle in front of you right now. And we want you to pick it up. So here's what I'm going to do in this moment. I, I, just, I just want everybody to just stand up on your feet real fast, if you don't mind. And if you're able, I just want you to turn around and I want you to drop on your knees. In these next few moments, uh, I, I, just, I just want you to talk. I just want you to talk to God. I want you to talk to your father. I want you to talk to your dad because I really believe that your lives were made, to, your whole life was meant to burn. For you to live in passion, to live in purpose, to know why you're here, for every day to be an adventure. I believe that with my soul. And right now, I just want you to talk to him. I want you to ask him. I want you to ask him, God, is there something in front of me right now that you want me to pick up? Is there something that I can do? I want more, God. I want more of you. If there's something on his heart to tell you. Some of you have been, you know, running from decisions to go in ministry. And, and I'm just telling you, right now, you're not going to get, you're not going to get moments like this. If you know that God's calling you to ministry in the next few moments, you need to talk about him, talk to him about that. You need to stop being afraid. It's okay to ask for more, but I want you to ask him. Some of you want more from God, but you know that there's a lot of stuff that you're going to have to leave behind right here. You're going to have to you're going to have to leave behind some relationships. Some pretty major things are going to 
need to change when you go home. So right now, I just want you to ask him, Father, what stays here? What doesn't go home? So in the next few moments, I just want you to talk to him. Maybe if you're a little lost right now and you're a little not sure, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to say, God, is, what is, what's one thing that you've been telling me that I'm missing? What do, you, what do you want me to hear from you right now? But just talk to him. Father, I, I know it's about you. You're a good God and you're a good dad. And Father, you have plans for these young men and women. Um, Father, plans for them to do and to be a part of um, what we never could have dreamed of. And, and, you know, Johnny and I have been doing this a long time. And the youth pastors out here. But Father, there is, there is miraculous, powerful, God-breathed things yet to come. And you're going to do things in them that you have never, that our eyes have never seen. Father, you're, I, I know with a group this size, not everyone's going to choose to pick up the mantle. But you have your initials carved in the hearts of some in here, Father, that are, that are longing for a life that matters, longing for a life that will burn, longing for a marriage, for a vocation, for, for just absolute beautiful relationships, no more hiding. So Father, in their hearts right now, Father, I pray that you would allow them the privilege of seeing ahead the beauty that you have ahead of them. Father, would you give them the courage like Elijah for the valley that's about to come. If they're making a decision for a fire on the mountain, there will be a valley that's coming up in the next few months. I, pro I, I know you, I, it's happening. But Father, I pray that in that valley you'd meet them with your same presence and that you'd provide for them, that you would teach them in that secret place things that they're going to need to know for the mountain that comes ahead. Father, for some of the people, and some of them are adults in this room, and some of them are, this has been a real passion. I don't know why this is such a thing. I just feel like there are people, students in the room, that you are calling into full-time ministry. And they know it. And Father, I pray that it would feel like a thousand pound weight on their shoulders until they can just say, I'm in. I know you've been talking to me and I've just been holding back and I've just been afraid and I don't know what to do. But God, tonight I'm just saying yes. I don't know what that means, but just yes. Father, there's some adults in this room, some adult leaders in this room. And even this week, they've been reminded of the call that you put on them all these year, those years ago. And it hasn't left. And they just, they just, they kind of hopped in and they thought it worked differently, but you still have a call in their life for full-time vocational ministry and they know it. And Father, I pray that in, the, in, in this moment, and they won't get many like this, that they'll just say yes, regardless of what they have to leave behind. And Father, I pray that for this room, that we pick up the mantle in front of us that we would immediately, starting now, starting tomorrow, starting the next day, that we'd start walking out the faith that you made for us, walking in the spirit, walking in power, trusting in the impossible, living out the heart of Jesus. We pray that in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.